So for those of you interested in the story of how strength training really helps battle cancer, we've interviewed some other people. And one of our favorites is Professor Paul Markle. Now, we interviewed him very shortly after he was diagnosed with cancer in episode 199. So you can go back and check that out in episode 199. That's the, I've just been diagnosed with cancer. I've had it for a few weeks and I'm doing everything I can to survive. This is kind of a mental toughness episode. And then we interviewed him again in episode 268. And it was really after he had come through the fire of cancer, but you could tell he was still sort of a shell of his former self. And so while the strength training really helped build up the foundation that he needed to survive it, you could tell it still had really, it had ravaged his body, but he had come through. Welcome to Barbell Logic Rewind. Welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast. I am Scott Hambrick. We have Matt Reynolds with us. And today it is a show with Student of the Gun Radio's Professor Paul Markle. And he is, uh, you know, fighting fixes everything, Paul. Fighting solves everything. That's what it, that's what it says. He's got this, the coffee mag that says uh, fighting solves everything. And he is uh, fighting a little bit of cancer. And so we thought we would talk to him about what, what that is like and what training is like for him. First off, Paul, what did you see? So Professor Paul has been training. How long have you been with us at... Uh, oh, at the- let's see. Going all the way back to January of January of 17. Okay. So two, not quite two and a half years now. Wow. You look great. You feel great. You're super strong. You've set PRs across the board. You called me a few weeks ago and um, actually Jared sent me a text and an email that said, dad needs to get a hold of you. It's a super emergency Um, (laughs) and and gave no indication what it was. Right. So the first thing I'm thinking is, okay, who's dead? Mm -hmm. Somebody's dead. Right. Jaeger's dead. Somebody is dead. So I was like, don't tell Jared to never do that again. So anyway, we, we, we connected. Uh, I said that we got to talk right now. And you said, I got to do lunch. I said, Paul, I can't function until I figure out what's going on and who's died. And so then you called me and, and you told me what? Uh, that I have cancer. What kind of cancer you got? It's a uh, cystic squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, basically, it's like P16 positive. Long story short, it's in my neck. Um, we found a lump in my lymph node. Lymph node, salivary gland, they're all like right there, you know, next to each other. And there, there was a, like a discernible bump and discernible lump there and i'm like hmm, this th-. and you know you always think that, you know it's it's like the old arnold schwarzenegger thing with a, a kindergarten cop where he says it might be a tumor and he's like it's not the tumor right. well it was a tumor uh, and that see, that's a sick irony of it is you know everybody jokes about that maybe it's a tumor yeah you know, anybody who's ever had experienced uh cancer uh knows that there, there's no quick cure there's no quick treatment there's no fast anything when it comes to that, then you go to this doctor and that doctor, and you go for this test and that test and the other test. And then they all get together and they're like, Oh, okay. Well, you know, for, and the scariest thing of course is, you know, the interim, Mm -hmm. you know, in the interim, uh, there, you know, the doctor's like, we know that that's cancer right there, but we don't know where else in your body it is. It could be in your lungs, your esophagus, your, you know, we don't know it's in your body and it could be everywhere or nowhere. Right. So then, you know, of course, I'm living in Wyoming, so that means I'm, I'm commuting an hour and a half, two hours, two and a half hours to, you know, treatment facilities and, and uh, well, basically testing facilities in Cheyenne and so forth. So they, they found out that it's only in my neck. It's nowhere else. It hasn't metastasized in my lungs. Right. And my, you know, and everybody says, oh, you're 50 years old. It's, you know, when I say I have cancer, they're like, oh, it's down there. I'm like, no, my butthole and my testicles are fine. Can confirm. By the way, there is an area between those two. You know. Yeah. Well, my my butt and my balls are fine. That's not. By the way, it's it's called your taint. A taint. Yeah. It taint your butthole and it taint your balls, and that's a prostate issue. That's yeah. where that that's where that beautiful prostate lives. But no, you're fine. So everything's in your neck. Yeah. And so the plan is to do what? So then the plan is like, well, all right, you're going to have to have radiation. The way they treat this type of cancer is direct radiation oncology. And I'm learning all the terminology now. Well, you know, I'm living out in the mountains in, in Saratoga, Wyoming, which is beautiful, but believe it or not, they don't have a cancer treatment facility there. 
Right. So the, the option was like go to Denver or, you know, some other place or Salt Lake City, which has a really good cancer treatment center. Uh, and Jared already lived here. Jared and his wife, Alex, already lived here. We already had a satellite office here. So that was really an easy choice to make to come here. But, you know, good doctors are like good attorneys. You don't just get in to see them that day. So I got my recommendation or my referral from the guy in Wyoming. And to and it took, you know, about three weeks for me to get over here and then to get seen at Huntsman. And then you start that process and they're like, okay, we want you to talk to this guy. And they wanted me to talk to a surgeon because I thought maybe, maybe we'll go in and we'll, you know, we'll cut it out. And then they said, no, we don't want to do that because they said, what do you do for a living? And I said, I host a radio show. And I'm like, hmm, we probably don't want to be cutting around your vocal cords. I'm like, yeah, you, you know, and it's one of those things like, well, if we could just cut it out and then clean it up with radiation, it'd be quicker. But the downside could potentially be, permanently altering your voice for life. I was like, Hmm. Okay. And they said, and so they're like, well, we don't want to, we don't want to do that much surgery in your throat. That would be like smashing a Stradivarius. Yeah, I know. Exactly. They're trying to silence the pimp hand of America. So they're like, well, we don't want to do that. We don't, we don't want to do that much invasive surgery in the, in the back of your throat and your neck. So now the now I'm on radiation. I'm actually on week two, almost done with week two of radiation, uh, and it's what they call the the gamma knife. Kind of a that's what the, one of the doctors refer to it as is, and they take gamma radiation. They take beams, and the beams. What it, the way it was explained to me is the beams. The computer knows. You know, I just lay there completely and totally immobile. They strap you down to a board. They put this mask over your head so you can't move at all. Uh, it's kind of like a medieval torture thing. And then they, uh, they shoot you with the beams. And when the beam, right where the beams touch each other is where the gamma radiation is. And that's right on. And then they did PET scans and, you know, they got all that stuff. So they have a real good inside outside picture of my body. How did, I want to hear more about how you found it because you know, I reached up and I did this. Ah, you just reach up and you check your carotid pulse. And there was a bump there. I was like, Hmm. How big of a bump did it feel like? Uh, like a, like an olive. Oh, okay. yeah. I have an olive underneath there. Yeah. I have charity soap me up every day and just palpate my whole body just looking because I don't want to get cancer. Is that what it is? Is that what mm-hmm. you do? <laughs> Checking for lumps. That's right. Yeah. Well, that's good. It's good. Yeah. Do you do the same? You return the favor? Uh, uh, no, she'll be fine. <laughs> oh, <Okay>, sure. Of <laughs> course. <laughs> of course. Of so course. You, one of the things that uh, Philip Midkiff and John Wilson and these guys who have come out of cancer. Of course, Wilson's still dealing with it. Midkiff has, has beaten his, and he had to go through radiation. He had a malignant skin cancer on up by his temple, uh, on one side of his head. And so he trained all the way through it. I mean, the main reason that we want to have you on the show is because we've talked to these two guys who have been through it on the other side. We haven't really talked to anybody who is in the middle of the fight. And from the very beginning, you and I talked on the phone, and you had this attitude that's like, I'm, I'm going to kick the shit out of this cancer. And I'm going to train all the way through it. And you started texting me. You used to do that in the early days. You would text me your PRs. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, it kind of becomes um, like life is just, and it's, and you just train and it kind of becomes a thing you do. Like it's now I'm getting these texts again about your, your lifting and your kicking cancer's ass. And you've got this, this motto of that fighting solves everything. And you're going to fight the shit out of this cancer. And so I wanted to have you on the show in the early stages of I'm going through radiation. You've done what, eight days, something like that at this point of radi- radiation. You have 30 to do. Is that right? 30 total. So, so you got 22 left and I want to talk to you again on the back end of this thing and see what your attitude is like and know that knowing that you're going to have, you know, this is going to be a tough six weeks for you, but want to have that testimonial recorded because I think it's important for our listeners to hear we talk a lot about voluntary hardship and uh, you are being faced with involuntary hardship that you've decided to use it as a method to, to refine yourself and to fight and to be a mentor or a role model for other people that deal with other hard things. And so sometimes we don't get to choose, but because you chose the thing that was hard and the hard path for the previous decades, I believe that you are better prepared for what you now have to face over the next month. Well, and you know, I'm sure you, you've talked to your previous guests and, and clients and so forth. And one of the main concerns of all the cancer doctors when they start doing treatment, and that's the sick and twisted thing about cancer is when you normally, if you get sick, 
you feel sick. You're like, I'm sick. Something's wrong with me, whatever. I got a disease or I broke something or whatever. You go to the doctor, you go to a hospital and they start giving you treatment and they give you treatment and it makes you feel better. That's how you know you're not sick anymore. Well, it's the exact opposite with cancer. Mm -hmm. Like you feel okay. Like I felt okay. I mean, I knew I had this bump here, but I didn't feel sick. I was nauseous and you know, sweats or whatever, you know? So you don't feel bad until they start treating it. And they're like, the more they treat it, you know, like if you went, if you had pneumonia, you went to the hospital, the more treatment you got, the better you feel. And then eventually you feel really great. And they're like, okay, you go home now. And with this, it's the exact opposite. The more they treat it, the worse you feel. It's a sick, twisted irony. But, uh, they're one of their main concerns because of that, and because you feel worse and you eat less, you don't want to eat and so forth, is that you're going to lose muscle mass and people get physically weak and the radiation and the chemo and so forth. Uh, I mean, if you ever talk to somebody a lot, a lot of times it, what's not necessarily the cancer that kills them is their body gets weak to the point where it, it can't sustain you know, they're concerned. They're like, man, I'm going to make sure you don't lose weight. And, you know, we don't want you losing muscle mass and, and so on and so forth. Probably kind of a good idea before you start the treatment to have some muscle mass on your body. Yeah. You know, that's, that's one thing that I've been doing. You know, I, I, I got diagnosed. I guess I got the phone call on, on February 22nd, but uh, I haven't, I had never stopped. I, I went into the gym that day because it was my program day and, and I did it. And I'll tell you the, the hardest thing now is I, I changed the keto diet because there are actually several studies that show that people who are on the ketogenic diet do better in chemo and radiation than those that don't. Yep. So I've been doing that and it's, it's been a mother Fletcher. I tell you what, uh, training and then going through the, the shift over to ketosis and so forth no, with no carbohydrates. So here yeah. you're doing this. <laughs> I told grandma, I was like, I did that entire workout with six carbs on board. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us what the experience of what it feels like. You're undergoing radiation therapy and you're training. And you're eight days in. Yeah. Tell us what that feels like. Well, yeah, it's, you know, they, they don't, they don't work on weekends. They don't work on holidays. So basically you do Monday through Friday treatment and, uh, you know, the first end of the first week, uh, by Friday, I, I felt like. Like after lunch, I had to have a nap and I, I, I get, I got that. And then, and they tell you, they're like, look, if you feel tired, sleep, don't try and muscle through it or whatever. If you feel tired, just sleep because we need you to do that. Um, and so I did. And then a few days ago, maybe three, four days ago, I started noticing the dry mouth, mm. uh, because the radiation is right there, you know, it's right by your salivary gland and so forth. And it's not doing that any good. Uh, so I got kind of a constant yuck mouth now. I take the special, I put the special mints and I rinse my mouth and all that. And it's, it's kind of a pain in the ass. And, but, uh, you know, that, that's what I've got right now. I, I, I feel like I'm good in the morning. And that's what I've talked to other people. And they said that that's very common. You know, they sleep all night and they get up and they're good in the morning. And I go, I get my treatments early in the morning between, you know, eight and nine every day. And, uh, you know, I go to work and do whatever, but then by two o'clock, three o'clock in the afternoon, my body's like, Hey, we need a nap. So let's go do this. But I haven't missed a training session since I started I've done my best. Even when we traveled recently, I, you know, I went to, uh, my son's birthday was two weeks ago, Zachary. We live in Salt Lake, which is only like five, six hours from Las Vegas. So we took him down there because I was about to start treatment anyway. Um, it was like two weeks ago. So I was going to be starting treatment. I knew I wasn't going to travel or do anything. But while I was down there, I went to Average Bros and, and I, I lifted. <laughs> I lifted the damn kilo plates that he has. <laughs> All right, do them. Uh, when are you training right now during the day? If you're getting your treatments in the morning, when are you actually lifting? What I normally do is I'll do the treatment and then I'll come here because the gym is here at our office and I will do that before lunch. You'll train in the mornings. Yeah. Because I kind of know my body and I know if I try and wait until the afternoon, it's going to be really hard. Yeah. So then almost the combination, I would assume, of the radiation early and then the training mid-morning mm. leaves you probably pretty not wiped out. And you have that nap in the afternoon and hope for kind of a second wind in the evening is the goal, I guess. So, you know, I and, and I lost, you know, I, and when I started on keto, it takes a while. I mean, obviously, every human being is different, um, but it takes a while for your body to like process over and you know the first week i was on it i'm like this is you know this is no big deal at all and i was lifting heavy weight and squatting heavy weight and 
you know, I was feeling pretty good about myself. And then, all right, I'll go ahead and admit something. When we moved, uh, we had to basically pack up an entire house and entire office and everything and move over here. And that was a, a bit of a stress on the entire family. Yeah, sure. But I did miss them. I did miss them, but uh, I haven't missed anything since we've been here. And when I got here and we got set up, I was feeling pretty, pretty washed out. Um, but I'm feeling better now. I'm feeling better now. I'm, I'm, you know, and Graham has been great. You know, I told him, and, and this is the main thing I would tell anybody is if look, you're doing a program and you ha- experience something like this, you got to tell your coach sure. so can help you and, and make adjustments. Cause it's not like something they've never heard before. Yeah. I think that's one of the deals that we learned when we trained Philip Midkiff that was going through this was that, you know, we, we want to keep him strong and we want to avoid the loss of muscle mass as much as we can while you're basically undergoing a treatment that the goal is to kill cells, right? I mean, it kills good cells and bad cells. It's going to kill all this stuff, right? And so figuring out how to tailor that. So for Philip, we, we moved him from like three sets of five to three sets of three, two sets of three, one set of three with a couple back off sets of three. And um, he's a little older than you. And so we were, you know, we just experimented with like what can he handle and what doesn't drive him into the ground and what allows him to keep uh, g- either getting stronger or maintaining strength the best you can. And really what you're doing is you're just chasing, you're doing the best you can to, to either PR or you're chasing taking weight off the bar as slow as possible, right? As you get sick and lose weight and get more ill from the radiation or even for some people chemotherapy or the combination of both that you're probably not going to be able to set PRs during that time. But the goal is to be able to take the weight off the bar as slow as possible, not take it off 10 pound plates at a time, but take it off, you know, one pound plates at a time. And so you've done a really good job so far of, of getting in the gym and keeping your weight heavy and Graham's programmed you well. I peek in on the programming that he's doing for you. And I'm excited to see what it looks like over the next four to six weeks, especially as you get towards the end, you know, and uh, see what you're, Matt's just, excited. Just what your mindset is. Matt's excited to see all this. Well, I mean, here's the deal, man, is that lots of people get this. Lots of people get cancer. The reality is that cancer, unfortunately, is a dime a dozen. Yeah. But people who choose to fight the cancer are rare. And people who choose to fight the cancer with physical tough things like heavy strength training are almost unheard of. And so we don't have that in the, we don't have much of that in the literature or to in real time, be able to talk to somebody and go like, Hey, this is, we know this is where you are. We have faith that you're going to beat this thing. And so I think it's important to tell your story about fighting cancer in the midst of it rather than after the fact. Oh yeah. And, and, you know, even, even this facility, I mean, this facility that we did research on it and uh, it's a, a renowned you know, facility in the, if you look up cancer treatment, where I'm at is, is, you know, it's probably high, pretty highly regarded, but, uh, they had their, the entire medical community, I believe in the United States of America is a, they're hamstrung by the, the fear of being sued sure. so because they're hamstrung by the fear of being sued. They won't endorse or do anything new or different or change. I mean, I, I had a dietitian hand me a thing saying I should be eating you know, I need to maintain my weight. So add peanut butter and, and, and tofu and, and all this stuff to my diet. Soy. I don't think I need, I don't need that uh, estrogen and I don't need soy. And she's like, oh, that's a myth. There's no estrogen in soy. Right. Okay. Whatever. And the paper said to avoid red meat because it could cause heart disease. I'm like, sure. what, what, what decade did they get this information it, it, what's amazing is how concerned you are right now with heart disease right don't you in the wish? middle of 30 days of radiation like hey listen we are real concerned <laughs> that in the middle of the radiation you could potentially have a heart attack like if all the steak you've been eating yeah. and you got right down to the last damn day of this radiation and you had a heart attack and died from the steak that you've eaten since that man has eaten since the beginning of time that you know don't eat red meat because that'll give you a heart attack in the midst of your radiation like what but you know, yeah, that's it, man. People get it. We, we deal with it all the time. Right. And the medical community is they terrify these kids from the very beginning in college. And so yeah, I, I love it that you've taken it in your own hands. You're like, look, I'm eating keto. I'm not going to like, again, we don't, we're not certain that that helps, but there's been a fair amount of studies on it. You guys want to look that up. I think I, I pointed you to Dom Diagostino. He's done a lot of studies there. I think Dr. Peter Atia has done some stuff there as well. And specifically low carb, no carb ketosis eating for 
for people with cancer and the results seem to be pretty good. And so it certainly isn't going to hurt. And so you drop the carbs, you continue to train, you get your protein in, you do your radiation, you do your training, you get your sleep, you take your naps and you're sort of uh, got a single focus right now, which is fighting this thing and beating the shit out of it. Well, in, in the, you know, the big thing that, that I see is we, as Americans, we love to throw slogans on stuff and we need, we like to throw words at things and they're like, you know, and I've said fighting solves everything for a long time, but you know, when people have cancer, they're like, we're going to fight this and fight and fight and fight and fight and fight. But saying the word fight really doesn't mean anything. It's like, well, what are you actually going to do? You know, what, what, what method do you have and how do you, how do you fight? I mean, obviously, you know, I'm a, I'm a, a gun guy and so forth. And, you know, you can't shoot cancer, right? You can't, you can't, you know, stab cancer. What, what do you do? And so I guess the main thing that I would try and pass on to other people is, you know, it doesn't really, I understand there's a mental component, but mental and physical go together. And, and just saying the words, we're going to fight this. We're going to fight it with everything we've got. Well, how, how, how are we doing that? You know, what, what are we doing? How are we fighting? And one of the physical manifestations that you can undergo is to actually make yourself be stressed, do that. And no one, and that's the thing is I've talked to, I've talked to a surgeon, a chemo doctor, a radiation doctor. I've talked to a nutritionist. I've talked to a physical therapist. I I mean, you go through all these consults. Not one single person said, you need to do physical exercise to keep your body strong. Not one. They're like, take naps and eat soy or tofu or whatever, you know, eat, eat lots of peanut butter. But not one person said, you know, it'd probably be a good idea if you got up and did something to, to strengthen your body. And that's something I asked him. I said, you know, um, you're talking about, you're afraid I'm going to lose muscle mass. That's your big concern is we don't want you to lose muscle mass. Don't want you to lose muscle mass. I'm like, so what is your solution? Right. So eat yeah. lots of peanut butter and yeah, tofu. Right. That'll help. Don't train, eat peanut butter and tofu. Be so, fine. Yeah. So, so uh, more concretes here. You're going for radiation therapy in the morning, um, mm-hmm. Monday through Friday, unless it's a bank holiday, because you know, oncologists take off on bank holidays and say, so yeah, don't work yeah. Memorial day. I'm off. I'm no radiation on Memorial day. Well, there you go. For, fortunately the tumor's off that day too. So that's cool. Yeah. And then you're training three times a week. Yeah. I'm on three times a week, three times a week. So you're just doing like the squat press deadlift. The next time you're doing squat bench press deadlift, I'm sure Graham, uh, as time goes on here, we'll alter your programming to make sure that it's work that you can recover from, but is uh, keeping you sufficiently stressed. And by golly, you've only got 22 more of these, sir. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to plug you because I know how, I think I know how you are. I think I do. There's a GoFundMe to, for cancer treatment for professor Paul that, uh, our mutual friend, James Jager set up because you wouldn't. That's what I heard. Is that true? Yeah, that's true. Uh, people need to pay you back. You're a great, you're a great help to all of your community and even to our community. So, uh, if you're interested in helping him, you can go to cancer treatment for professor Paul on the GoFundMe. You can go to a student of the gun.com and subscribe to all of their content there, listen to the radio show, and go to studentofthegungear.com and go buy The Operator by Paul's secret friend, Nicholas Orr. That's a book your wife might like, actually. It's, it's on Amazon. It's on Amazon as a Kindle or paperback version. There we go. So you'd have it instantly. That is a... It right uh, now. It's, it's an action adventure with romance in it. Mm, sounds titillating. <laughs> That's such a gross word. My wife has asked me to tell you that she would like Mr. Orr to write another. Oh, so she's she's read it. Oh, yeah, so yeah. She, oh, yeah. In fact, Charity was titillated. Yes, and she has. there's an autographed copy of it over here at her desk. Oh, is there? Here. Yes, that's, that's right. She's a big fan. So, you know, have you noticed a difference in your taste bud yet? Can you taste okay still? Things are starting to taste like Play-Doh. Can you taste on your left side where they're not? I mean, is that is the left side significantly better than the right side or at this point is it all sort of getting dry and i mean i, I like i said that it's because it's affecting the salivary gland yeah. i work really hard to keep my mouth yeah wet. you get those little uh, those little mint things you got to put in your pouch and it kind of makes that gel and keeps your mouth liquefied yeah so yeah yeah i was gonna say we talk about when we define strength as you know, the ability to produce force against an external resistance and we talk about how the world uses this term strength and we often even equate it to people who don't know better will say, oh, he was really strong because he beat cancer. 
Like, that's an actual thing you'll hear people say, right? This idea, like, he was, and what they really mean is, like, well, they were mentally tough, right? I love the fact that you're going to beat cancer because you're actually strong. You're not strong because you beat cancer, but a big process of you beating cancer is because you're actually strong, because of your ability to produce force against resistance, because of your hypertrophy and muscle mass that you have already gain in the years of the trenches of building this up so that you didn't know this thing was coming. No. no. But then you get the phone call and you go, God, how, how thankful are you that you've done these things to ready yourself, to be ready for the fight, not knowing what that fight was like, man, that fight could be any myriad of things. And you've been thrown the fight of cancer and now you get to prove what the strength thing does for you. And, uh, yeah. And you know, when I got that phone call, I literally not figuratively, not hypothetically, but literally was stronger, physically stronger than I believe I'd ever been in my life. Uh, and, and I've done a lot of things. I've been, you know, as a Marine and, and so forth. And, and I've been cardiovascularly strong or core strength or whatever. But I mean, actual, when I recorded strength, like I know that I can put X on this bar and I can pick it up off the ground. And I know I can put, I can squat X because I've written it down and I've watched my progress over the years. And I'd never put that much weight on a bar and squatted it before. I never, I didn't even know how to deadlift until I met you. So I didn't have anything to measure it to, but I, I could literally say that I was physically stronger, you know, in my life than I had been up to that point uh, when I got that phone call. Yeah. That's awesome. Hey man, we love you. Thank you for being part of the family. Thanks for letting your family be part of our family, uh, the greater collective of uh, Barbell Logic, and we're thankful for you. I mean, I, I'm not excited for the cancer, but I am excited to see the journey and the number of lives it's going to touch and change. And you were going into it with this outlook on life that was still very positive, and, and I'm going to fight this, and I'm going to work through the battle. And so we told your story sort of in the midst of that. You told your story in the midst of it. And things got really hard. I want to go into that at some point. But you are now in recovery. And so we said when we did that podcast months ago, over half a year ago, that we were going to have you back on the podcast when you were getting back to your old self again. And that's you now. And so you've actually written a new book. How many books have you written total? Um, many. You have no idea? Guess. Yeah, uh, 20-ish. Okay. So you have a new book out called Fighting Solves Everything. It's really a story of your fight through cancer and all of the sort of important things that played into that. Your faith, your strength training, your nutrition, your family support. And so um, let, let's go back to where we were in the spring. That's sort of the prequel to this. Yeah. Back in the spring, you've been diagnosed with cancer and you were just starting your radiation treatments Give us a quick synopsis there of what kind of cancer did you have? It was a squamous cell carcinoma. Basically, it was in the back of my throat. Uh, I could base my tongue and so forth. And I discovered it because I reached up and to feel my carotid pulse and I felt a lump. And I was like, hmm, that's kind of weird. And you know what's in that area? You've got your salivary glands and all that jazz. And, and of course, you know, I thought, well, it'll go away. Or, you know, it could have been, you know, you went to Dr. Google and Dr. Google says you could have been exposed to a virus or bacteria. And if it doesn't go away in two weeks, see a doctor. And it didn't go away. And I did see a doctor. I didn't just ignore it. And they're like, hmm, this is different. Let's check it out. And, you know, fast forward a couple of weeks, I got the news. I was in Laramie, Wyoming. And he said, it's definitely cancer. And, mm. but, and this is what we're going to do. And this is what we can do. And, well, first we have to do a full body scan and figure out you know, if it's anywhere else and all that. And then we have to do a biopsy. So we'd done all that. They did the biopsy and uh, we realized that type of cancer I had, the primary treatment was direct radiation oncology. Because it wasn't, it had not spread anywhere else. They could only find it there. It was, it was only in my neck throat area, which right. is the good news. If you're going to have cancer, that's good news. So uh, he said, well, here's the deal though. You have to go 30 radiation treatments and it's uh, five times a week for six weeks minimum. And if that's, if they don't have any holidays or breaks, because believe it or not, even the cancer fighters at the radiation thing, if it's 4th of July, they're not working. They're not going. Yeah. So you're just going to have to come another day. And it ended up being about seven weeks with the, you know, the, the various days and so forth. And, he's, and at the time I was living in, in Saratoga, Wyoming, 
beautiful town out in the mountains. Uh, 90 minutes with traffic was good and there was no weather to Laramie. Uh, if traffic was bad, God knows how long. So we need to call this the Battle of Saratoga then. Yeah, this that was a, a serious commute. And he said, you're going to have to figure out what you're going to do because commuting round trip to the hospital three hours a day is not going to cut it. And I said, yeah, obviously it's not going to cut it. And, and I didn't realize how many doctor's visits I was going to have to have before then. I spent a lot of time at the Huntsman Cancer Research Center here in Salt Lake City. So we ended up in Salt Lake City because... Uh, that's where, uh, A, Jared lives. And Jared's been here for several years, like three years now. He just moved into a house that had an extra bedroom. And we're like, here's the deal. Dad has to have cancer treatment. And his house, fortunately, is like 10 minutes, maybe 15 if traffic is heavy from the hospital. So go team. Uh, favor of God right there. So we basically, in a period of six weeks, we packed up an entire house, an entire business, everything we owned put it in trucks and, and drove it to Salt Lake City and stuck it in storage so that I could start doing cancer treatment. And, uh, you know, and, and we mentioned this prior to now, but uh, you know, when, when you go through that and anybody who's ever had to, it's not just, there's not just one doctor. There's like this whole battery of doctors and specialists and nutritionists and, and all these people uh, that you have to talk to and consult with in this. And they're like, you're going to do chemo. And, uh, and the, the thing about chemo, they tried to uh, they tried to convince me to do chemotherapy, and I did the research on it, and I did the research on the specific chemical that they wanted to put in me, and I discovered that it was horrible. Now, most therapy is horrible, but this chemotherapy that they wanted to give me, uh, it's full of heavy metal, platinum, uh, which destroys your hearing, and, and chemotherapy can ruin your kidneys and, and things like that. And you're like, well, you're, you're just kind of a stubborn a-hole, and well, the, 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 even the chemo doctor, he said, he goes, the type of cancer you have is not curable by chemotherapy, but we still want to give it to you because we think it may give you a five to 10% better chance of successfully beating this. And I was like, all right, well, for five to, for ten, let's, let's talk about five to 10%. I'm already strength training and I had been, I was on the ketogenic diet. I got started on that as soon as I got diagnosed. And, I, you know, at the time, I was a relatively young guy. I still am, I guess, comparatively. Hmm. Um, how, how old are you? I just turned 52. Uh, I didn't just turn 52. I turned 52 uh, during my treatment. So I'm, you know, I, was, I, was in, I wasn't in bad health. I mean, I was in good health. Pretty strong. And I was pretty strong. You know, um, a year ago, before I got diagnosed, I hit a personal record squad of 375, which I think is pretty good for an old man. Yeah, real good. You tell me. 51-year-old guy. <laughs> not super old, but you know. Oh, it's listen. Three hundred, three hundred seventy-five pound squat is pretty good for anybody. It's pretty good for a young man. Yeah. So, I mean, I I was feeling really strong when I hit this. And the day I got the phone call, you know, the doctor called me in and he said, "I I usually don't like to do this over the phone because I'd rather do it in person." But you're ninety minutes away, so here's the deal: you have cancer, and that's that's a hell of a phone call. But that day was my scheduled, my program training day. I was supposed to lift that day. And I did. I went down and I went into the gym and uh, I racked up the weights and got under the bar. And when I put that bar on my shoulder, there was a, a little bit of a difference I knew. I was like, I'm not doing this for ego gratification. I'm not doing this so I can look good in a swimsuit. I'm doing this to save my own life. And that's how I approached it the whole time. Yeah, I think that's right. Even for folks that haven't gotten a diagnosis yet. Like, I'm trying to put that stuff in the bank because uh, unless I hit a tree or just, you know, or just sure. die in my sleep, you know, we all get our diagnosis, don't we? Yeah. At some point in time. Yeah. I want to go back and re revisit. You mentioned you had gone on the ketogenic diet. You have a, a good friend, Dr. Dan from SWAT Fuel. Mm -hmm. You called him. You called me. I think you called us on the, actually, Jared scared the shit out of me. I think I, I told this story on the previous. Yeah podcast you run he was like call dad right now it's an emergency and i was like oh god somebody's dead you're in the tactical industry <laughs> so <laughs> so there's a lot of guns involved with you and everyone in your circle of friends and so i was like oh my god what the hell's happened and so uh <laughs> it was a sense of relief to find out that you just had cancer and no one was dead yeah i know and, uh, yeah but you had told me you had called dr dan and he had suggested that you go on a ketogenic diet and we're still pretty early in the research on that, but the research looks really good for people who have cancer 
that when they stop eating carbohydrates, it seems to slow or even potentially stop the spread of that cancer. Uh, something about cancer cells feed on carbohydrates, we believe, and all this is still really early. Um, I've talked about this on the podcast before. I think Dr. Dom Diagostino is one of the leading researchers on that. So you can look up some of his stuff, but you were kind of the opinion of like, hey, it definitely can't hurt and it might help. So I'm getting off the carbs. Yeah. Is that fair? You've got a copy of the book. Yep. And if, if you look in the book, uh, there's a study by Dr. Brian Allen and some of his colleagues at the University of Iowa who did a, a, a very intensive research study about the effects of the ketogenic diet on patients who are going through chemo radiation. And these medical papers are really long. But the, the upshot is the people who did it and dedicated themselves to the keto did 50% better than the people who didn't. That's worth messing with, yeah. Yeah, so even if it's you know correlation and not causation, it's for you, it was like, look, I'm going to do everything I can. That was something that was in your control, I guess, really is the easy thing to say, right? Like, there are certain things you could control here, and there are certain things you can't. And one thing you can control is what you put into your body. And so you chose to not put the chemotherapy in your body, which certainly I'm not a doctor, but if I understand correctly, chemotherapy is a, is a systemic drug. Like, it's going to affect all of the cells. Yes. Radiation is acute. They put sort of a cone on you, right? And, and sort of zapped the area, for lack of a better term, that had the cancer with the radiation so that your, your arms and your legs and your torso didn't receive the radiation, but this area in the, the back of your throat did. Um, and then you decided like, hey, I'm only going to put protein and fat in my body. I'm not going to put, I'm not going to feed it any carbs. Mm. I remember you texting me or calling me about two weeks in, maybe 10 days into that and be like, uh, the workouts are hard. <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah, you don't have any carbs, right? So that's, <laughs> I don't even think you had started the radiation yet. And you were, the only major thing you had changed was that you weren't eating carbohydrates. And you were like, dude, the workouts are really hard. And I was like, yeah, they're really hard. You're going to have to back off your volume. You're just going to have to do the best you can to maintain. And, but you stayed with it and you kept training. Yeah, I kept training the whole time. I didn't stop training until they put me in the hospital. And because I, I kind of couldn't. That was actually after we had you on the podcast. When we had you on yeah. the podcast, it was still, you were like a 22 year old teacher in public school who was fresh out of college, who was like ambitious and ready to take on the world. And you were like that, I think, with, with the cancer. And then I don't want to, I don't want to make this be too Pollyannish. It was, re you went through several months where it got really, really hard, right? So how much did you weigh when you got diagnosed with cancer? I had a I had an annual man physical, and matter of fact, I just got a, a message uh, today reminding me it's time for to schedule my annual physical. I had an annual physical, and I was like, uh, I was like two forty eight. Okay, yeah, and they're like, oh, you're two forty eight. Let me tell you what, mother lovers, mother lovers, I was two forty eight and strong. And, yeah, and you, this, were, you were like, you were you were the strongest you'd ever been in your life. I point. was. I was demonstrably. Right. I mean, on paper, in you know, not notionally, or I feel strong, or I think I'm strong. No, like factually, I was factually stronger than I ever had been in my life. And I've just, I actually texted you the other day. I just passed our three year anniversary yeah. uh, with you. Yeah, you came out to you came out to Jaeger's place. That's right. I was doing some seminars. That's right. I was doing seminars for strength seminars for tactical guys mm -hmm. and James Jagger had invited you and Jared out and you guys came out and trained and it's always interesting like tactical guys are actually really similar to to sports guys like basketball players or you know other like soccer players people who are like they're really into the thing and they recognize that strength training will make them better but certainly their gear right they want like shiny guns and giant mags and cool first Mm -hmm. They're in a tactical training second and often like strength training and the sort of mental hardships that sort of like being mentally prepared for the fight is like way down the list. Yeah. And for you and Jaeger and a lot of those guys that are kind of in the same community, that mental toughness thing is way up at the top. And so I remember three years ago when we met, you were weak, put you through the seminar, taught you how to do this stuff, but you, you really took to it right away and you, you committed to it and had been training for several years going into the cancer and when you were diagnosed, you were the strongest probably of your entire life. I mean, I was a United States Marine and, and I know what it's like to be cardiovascularly in shape. When you met me, I was probably in pretty good cardiovascular shape, but I didn't know how. But like, like most adult men who've never been trained, you just you, you watch others and you mimic them. 
You know, you go to the yeah. gym or you, you see things and you think, okay, I'm going to go into the gym and, and I'm going to go to that rack weight area and I'm going to do what I think I should be doing because I've watched other chimpanzees, you know, mimic that exercise. Right. So that's what I do. It's, it's, you're like a chimp watching somebody eat a sandwich and you just do it yourself. So, uh, I mean, that that's what most untrained men do. They, they go into planet fatness and they, you know, lift up stuff and then they walk around. And I mean, I understood how to become cardiovascularly strong. You know, I could do several miles on a treadmill or whatever, but I didn't know how to properly squat. I did not know how to, I didn't had no idea how to deadlift, you know, other than just watching people. Uh, and, and, you know, men do ego exercises like curls and benching. And that's it. And, and, you know, and, and I want you to be proud of me. I finally unlocked the secret of leg drive on the bench. All right. That's, it, it, it only, that's it only hard took to me do. This, this long. It's hard to teach online. It is hard. So we, Reynolds got you squashing, right? And you're weighed 248 and you get a diagnosis. You get a ketorific on it. Take some poisonous drugs in the form of chemotherapy well, I didn't take any oh. chemo. Oh, you didn't? Radi oh, that's right. Your radiation. radiation the targeted which stuff. Is, which is still poisonous drugs. Right. You, they did a silkwood on your neck and irradiated you. Yeah. And then what did you weigh at the lowest? Uh, I was down to 195. Hold on. I dropped about 50 pounds. That's great, right? And I remember seeing you at 195, and you look like a sick cancer patient. And yet, and yet, if you had started at 195, and you had gone down to 145, what's that like? Oh, I would have looked like an Auschwitz victim. Well, you might have been dead. I would have right? looked like a black and white photo from, you know, Birkenau or, or, or freaking Sobibor right. or something like that. Uh, so this is total speculation, probably. But do you think that there was 53 pounds to be lost from whatever your starting point was or roughly? Because you didn't, you just couldn't eat because it was your neck. Yeah. What, what happened is they irradiate your neck and what they call the, the machine's nickname is the gamma knife because they're, they're using gamma radiation. And I did not turn into the Hulk, but I'm, I'm on my way back. I'm like the mother flesh and Wolverine. Uh, so, and I told the doctor that the other day, she's like, you're, oh, you're, you're doing really well. Your progress, you're coming back. And, and as I said, yeah, because I'm the mother flesh and Wolverine. Don't you forget it. <laughs> and my wife sits over in the corner and rolls her eyes. And she's like, I don't even know this person. But uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I had, I'm sure I had some body fat on me, but I also had a, more muscle on me than I ever had in my life. And the sick, ironic, strange thing about this, you know, going into talking to all these professionals is they know that muscle loss is a problem. They know it. And I sent you guys, you know, what, like a month or so ago that they just recently, they discovered that maybe we should make or suggest that people who are going through chemo radiation do strength training. Maybe we're thinking, we don't know. We're not sure. It might want to do that. You need to be yeah. careful. Don't be hasty. Yeah, you know, take it easy. Take it easy now. Uh, because they compared, you know, during the original moon launches and, and the original NASA missions, they compared the, uh, the muscle atrophy and the problems that astronauts were experiencing. And they looked and they're like, wow, there's a parallel here between what was what's happening with these astronauts when they go into outer space and the problem they experience with the, the weightlessness and the muscle atrophy. And it's not just external. It's like even their heart muscle and so forth. So they had to come up with a program to make these astronauts strong and fit because when they sent them out into space, it was going to affect them negatively from a physical standpoint. And somebody had a light bulb and they're like, wow, that seems just like what happens when we, we treat people with radiation and chemo. Maybe. We might want to tell these people to get on a treadmill and lift some weights and be strong instead of telling them to eat tofu and peanut butter. Yeah. Because that's the suggestion they gave me. They're like, we, we don't want you to lose. We're really afraid you're going to lose muscle mass and, you know, and that's going to happen. So, you know, we, you need to change your diet and, and you need to add things like peanut butter and tofu and mashed potatoes. Really? Yeah. What you need is more soy, sir. Yeah. That's, that's what you need. You need more, <laughs> you need more peanut butter and soy. That's, that's going to bulk you right up their solution to helping you maintain quote muscle mass is to fatten you up. Yeah. Estrogen so, and fat. What? So they irradiate, they burn your neck. Yeah. Your esophagus is irritated. Your salivary glands are shut down. You can't salivate dry mouth, hard to swallow, hard to eat. 
pretty much impossible to eat. Yeah. Uh, the reason I was in the hospital, I went and they put me in the hospital first of June. Uh, I was like two weeks after I talked to you guys, and uh, because I couldn't, sw- I couldn't swallow anything. I couldn't swallow water. Oh, one of the one of the great benefits uh, of of that uh, treatment is that uh, it affects your immune system, right? And, and you end up getting essentially thrush, like babies get. You get thrush with, uh, in 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 infection, so you've got the pain from the irradiated tissue, which doesn't like that, and so it, it obviously hurts. And then you get an infection on top of that, which makes it hurt even more. Insult to injury. Yeah, it's insult to injury. We had John Wilson on this show, episode 26, a long time ago. And John Wilson has been dealing with um, with stage four cancer for uh, about five years now. Yeah. And the, the he, one who the doctors can't believe he's still there. Yeah. I listen to this. Yeah. He's just a big, strong guy. And they ramp up his meds from time to time. And he's unable to eat. He's nauseous. He struggles with nutrition. But he weight trains as hard as he can when he can, and he eats when he can, as much as he can. And he's been able to fight this very effectively. And so have you. It's a testament, man. Listen, it's you. You're the one who lifted up the barbells. Yeah, and you know that, that's something that I wrote about in the book is, uh, you know, the, the worst thing you can do, in, at least in my own opinion, and I'm not an expert on being a cancer patient, although I, you know, I know more than, than I did a year ago, is the worst thing you can do is just surrender yourself to the medical industry and say, okay, well, Whatever they say to do, right? I'll just do that. If you ask my wife, she'll tell you that I probably wouldn't be here right now. If I would have just surrendered to the medical community and done what they consider the standard, uh, because all of what I'm talking about, the keto diet and the strength training and so forth, none of that was in their lexicon at all. That's alternative medicine. Yeah, that is like... Arr! But what's weird is I left in Wyoming. They're like, oh, Wyoming's a backwards hillbilly. When, when I talked to the doctors in Wyoming and I told them like, hey, I'm, I'm doing the keto and the, you know, doctor, the cancer doctor in Laramie is like, good, because I was going to tell you to do that anyway, but you're already doing it. So keep doing it. Good job. Excellent. I get to Salt Lake City and I tell the doctor here and they're like, ah, that, that, that. you don't need to go on a diet. You need to listen to what we tell you to do. I'm like, OK. Nice. I was like, I don't think you understand what you're dealing with here. This is a freaking alpha male you're talking to. Any any residual effects of the treatment? Oh, uh, fortunately, thank the Lord. You know, this is a blessing. My taste buds came back, mm. but my taste buds aren't worthy. My taste buds are essentially the taste buds of a three-year-old. So a lot of chicken tenders and... Uh... Uh, yeah, well, yeah, anything, nothing spicy, nothing like spicy hot. Right. Uh, spicy hot. To, like imagine you're giving, your, giving a piece of spicy pepperoni to a three-year-old and they put it in their mouth and, like, and they spit it out. <laughs> Wow, that's kind of that's kind of me. Uh, it, it's almost as if, like physiologically, that my taste buds were wiped out, like and I and they hit the reset and they're regrowing, as they're regrowing as if I was, you know, if I was a toddler, two or three years old. Yeah, maybe so. So uh, my taste buds are regrowing and, and redeveloping, I guess you could say. But and I still get the dry mouth, but not as bad, not nearly as bad. Thank the Lord. Uh, I can drink coffee. I can tolerate coffee. I couldn't tolerate coffee, which is oh, just terrible. Oh, my God. Why live? I know. Why be alive if you can't drink coffee? But, yeah, that and every once in a while, I, you know, I'll, I'll get in. The, the worst thing about coming off of the uh, of the uh, narcotic pain medicine is the the physical withdrawal because it's there's an actual physical withdrawal because your brain, your mind has gotten used to that. And when it's not there, it doesn't like it. So you think you were a junkie? I mean, you think you had opioid dependency for a time there? Oh, I had a hundred percent opioid dependency that with it, I was on fentanyl and Dilaudid. Oh, wow. You're hardcore, bro. Yeah. Yeah. Like I was, yeah. When, when I, when I got out of the hospital because of the, the damage in my throat, that was on like elephant strength, freaking narcotics. Yeah. And, uh, so what's withdrawal from that? Like, well, by the way, Matt Reynolds is back. He's wearing a baby blue ribbed <laughs> pullover Henley. You always just mention it when I wear this shirt. Yes. It's, um, it's lovely. You just look like a big huggy bear. Is that periwinkle? In, is that that color? Is that what that is? That's that could be periwinkle. Only in Springfield, Missouri, do you pay for one gigabit internet, and it is so slow that it kicks you off in the middle of a podcast. Somebody Welcome downloaded to the, the Ozarks and it messed you up. So yeah, that's right. So on somebody on Napster. While you were gone, Professor Paul was telling us about being a junkie. Yeah, I, I heard that. So he was on fentanyl and Dilaudids, which is Dilaudid is actual hospital heroin. Yeah, that's really what it is. Yeah. So what, what was and what's withdrawal is from that like, like? Yeah, it's got to be insane. Did they wean you off? Yeah. When when they do that, 
I finished up my my 30 treat my 30 radiation treatments and then there's so much damage that they can't even they didn't even bother to do a ct scan for uh 90 days because they're like there's so much damage we could scan you but we don't know what's damage and what's cancer or whatever so we just, you just got to go away and that's a mother flesher right there because they're like well we figure we probably got it all but we don't know come back in three months just go marinate on that for three months right so i just marinated on it for three months they literally do no testing no, no PET scan to even see if no, because they say that there's no point in us doing a PET scan because that whole area is inflamed and damaged. Right, because they're hammering it so hard with radiation, they're not concerned that it's like in your lymph nodes and your armpits or anything, which is maybe one of the next closest sort of like yeah. danger zones, right? Yeah, so they're like, well, just you know, come back, uh, and and we did. I did on September 11th. I had my PET scan, and, and the doctor said he goes, "Oh, good news." If things are looking good. And I said, I don't want to hear things are looking good. I want you to look at me in the face and say, you don't have cancer. Right. And he laughed at me because doctors apparently aren't used to being talked to by me. And uh, he's like, okay, you don't have cancer. I said, all right, that's what I want to hear. Don't, don't give me this, any of this doctor jive, this in remission, things are looking good. And, 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 well, you know, things are looking good to you and things are looking good to me are not necessarily the thing looking good. I am looking at, as, as we speak, Paul, I am looking at, so first off, if you follow Paul Markle, M-A-R-K-E-L, Paul is spelled like you spell Paul. I am looking at your first workout back post radiation. It's July 15th of 19 and you are squatting the empty bar. Coach Graham has you with a tubo. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody loves that. Because you're a tubo, you've got to use a tubo because otherwise your your knees go all over the place. You're benching with an empty bar. Mm -hmm. And it looks like you're deadlifting 10, so you've got 65 pounds on the bar. First workout back. And so you were at a 45-pound squat, a 45-pound bench press, a 65-pound deadlift, and then also 45-pound press, because I can see it a couple days later here. You do a 45-pound press. What are your weights up to now so that was July. I just I just finished in the gym like a half an hour ago, and uh, I, today's squat was two thirty five. My bench workout was today was a light bench workout, so I did one fifty seven point five for three by fives, and it was a light a light deadlift, so it was two twenty five. My heavy deadlift workout on Saturday is going to be two sixty five. Okay, so a two hundred pound increase. And well, today the, the 235, I did three by three per day, 235 squats. And that, that's the heaviest I've been since I, I came back. When you came back, did you have bad DOMS? Were you sore? Not, not really. I mean, the, the soreness wasn't right there. The, the main thing was like just convincing my muscles to do the movements correctly again. You know, that was my primary focus was trying to, to do the maneuvers, try to do the movements correctly, you know, and remember the, okay, you know, knees, Poop over a cliff, you know, feet and <laughs> poop over a cliff. Yeah. Is that it's a, Poor it's a coaching cue for you? <laughs> yeah. That was, that was my, one of my cues. Poop Let's over a back. cliff. That's probably not a bad cue. Hambrick, my experience is for soreness is when somebody comes back from like, obviously this is real bad sickness and they come back and they go insanely light like Paul did where he was doing the empty bar. Mm -hmm. They don't get sore. Yeah. What? What I used to find, I can remember that I always had sort of best laid intentions when I was a football coach, high school football coach, literally a decade ago, but I was, I was pretty strong. And I would be like, oh, I'm going to train all through football season. And then I wouldn't because you end up working 20 hour days. You come back after two and a half months off. And because strength, it detrains so slowly, I might be able to come back and squat 315 on my first day back. 315 for even one set of five, it's not let good. alone three sets of five. It will wreck you for a week if you haven't done it for two and a half months. Yep. But an empty barbell, you know, you were just sort of learning the movement again. And you've just gone back to a basic linear progression again. Yeah, I went through LP a second time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're and, doing great. And, um, you know, we have, we have people do LP after vacations, after layoffs, after hip replacement, after all kinds of stuff. But they typically don't experience the weight loss you experience. So this is like a legit one. Like you got to up your calories. This is like the first time all over again. Yeah, it really is. Uh, yeah, I'm back to I'm I'm two eleven. I'm back to. 2 I was going to ask. Okay, nice so, effort. Okay, so you've put on almost twenty pounds. Yeah, you you look like a different person than you did eighteen pounds ago. It's a glorious look. Like really, man. like you look like a healthy fifty two year old guy. 
How dare it's amazing you. how well it's a, if you it, so if you go back and look at his Instagram, he's Paul, a, he you, you look you like a healthy forty four year old man. Well, you know what I mean. So you sort of upped your postings really over this. You chronicled it well. Yeah. Well, and and that's you know that's why I wrote the book. You know, the fighting solves everything book. And where can people find that? Palmer? It's on Amazon. It's it's really hard to find. There's just this this little website. It's a niche website called Amazon.com. Started as a book website. Yeah, and they have books there and everything else in the world. No, the, the book's on Amazon.com as a paperback, and it's also a Kindle version. It's an Amazon Prime product. And if you have Kindle Unlimited, you can just download it instantly to your tablet or your phone and read it. I had several long conversations on the phone with Jaeger in April. And uh, he said, you know, he goes, what do you do? And I said, uh, I do a lot. He goes, he goes, what do you do? I said, I, I write. He goes, yeah, you write. He goes, you have to write about you have to chronicle this. And I said, I know you're right. I know you are. And then the book actually was, it was written in two time frames. It was written at the beginning. I started the book when I didn't know how the outcome was going to be, mm-hmm. which is unusual. Usually when you write a book, you're like, I know how it's going to begin. I know how it's going to end. I know what's going to be in the middle. Let's go. And when I started it, when I wrote the, the, the foreword and everything, I had no idea because I hadn't started radiation treatment yet. I hadn't, hadn't experienced any of that. And then I didn't really write at all when I was laid up because, quite frankly, that one of the evil things with the, the fentanyl and, the, and the, the narcotic pain medicine is the brain fog. It's hard to focus for long periods of time, and it really, it's hard to focus or to write creatively. But I got out of it, and I finished it, and we published it, and then then and uh, there's there's a lot of bonus material in there. You know, my my wife, she's a saint, uh, and she had to come up with all these keto recipes from nowhere. You know, like one day we were just cruising along and then the next day I'm like, hey, guess what? We need to have all these keto recipes and we need to try and eat like humans and not just eat chicken breasts every day, you know. And then when I had the tube in, she had to figure out how to keep me, uh, you know, healthy through a feeding tube in the hospital. They're like, oh, give them insure or boost that, that uh, it's, it's you want to kill someone, give them four meals of boost a day. Boost. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or ensure, yeah, ensure that you'll die. That's what it ensure. Ensure that you're going to crap your pants. You know, that's what it ensures. Ensure you're going to have horrible diarrhea. So, you know, she she had to come up with all these recipes, and and she just had to like do it by trial and error. And that's all in the book. She's got all these blended recipes, which are are really wild. That would make like the most amazing protein shakes. I was reading through this the other day. The blended meal base number four, which is fresh summer squash, zucchini, chicken bone broth. Chicken breast, four ounces of chicken breast, one slice of beef liver, which is four ounces, like a big slice of beef liver, sausage links, milked walnuts, olive oil, <laughs> protein powder, and ranch dressing. And she blended it up and fed him in his feeding tube. Yeah. It's, it's so cool. And that's the wonderful thing about a feeding tube is, is you, it doesn't matter what it tastes like. It just goes in. That's right. That's true. Have you tried to drink any of these afterwards? No. That'd, be fun. That'd be a fun like blog post you that could make be. to like just try to blend it and drink all this stuff. Who milks um, the walnuts? That's what I want to know. Yeah, that's why I was. I literally, Scott, you're wearing off on me. I was like, I want to be a professional milker. I'll start with walnuts and work my way up. <laughs> I don't mind. They're, they're hiring down here at the Tulsa Day Spa. <laughs> are, are they? Milk and walnuts. Uh, there you go. Walnuts. I don't know if it was Jared or if it was you or if it was the shipping ogre, but someone sent a copy of Fighting Solves Everything to my wife. And we got that thing about two or three days before Christmas. And Charity flopped down on the couch and about three and a half, four hours later stood up and said, I'm done and enjoyed it thoroughly. And then it's a super enjoyable read. And then I see behind you one of my wife's favorite books, The Operator by one Nicholas Orr, who is an author that is published by uh, the Student of the Gun organization. It's a, uh, it's what I call... Well, we work closely with Nicholas Orr. What, it's what I call a dirty girl novel. <laughs> like, uh, you guys go outside and play Mama's Reading Her Dirties right now. Nah, it's not That's that bad. It's not that bad. It's an action-adventure novel is what it is. But it's got that Mommy's Lonely kind of adventure in it. And, 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 and Charity, Charity keeps asking for part two in the series... And, uh, it's the prof- coming. The professor has told me that Nicholas is working on that, and she's she's eager to. Busy hear about guy. That. He's a busy guy. Yeah. You guys go on Amazon. Professor Paul has fighting solves everything. He's got a bunch of other great books too. Does fighting solve everything? Yes, it does. Hmm. Yes. 
Would Nicholas Orr agree with that? No, absolutely. No, no. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah, pick pick it up, pick it up at Amazon. It's a list I I mean this in a positive way, not a negative way. It's an easy read. It's an it's it's actually for being a book about fighting cancer, it's an enjoyable read. It's got a, a happy ending, you know? Yeah, there's that there's that. <laughs> Thank you for you <laughs> he say, doesn't you, die. You say nice things about us and I appreciate that. It's a cool book that is sort of adjacent to Barbell Training, where Barbell Training plays a big part of it. Paul, you have lived a life of voluntary hardship so that when you got involuntary hardship handed to you via cancer, mm -hmm. you were better able to fight against it. And I think that's a really cool story. Over the years, I've started to get some experience with folks that have, uh, have been barbell training and then have to go deal with chemotherapy or radiation or maybe even both and uh, ain't lost one yet. Nope. Wilson's still kicking. You're good for another 40. My mom, I think it's in June, will be two years ago, got a breast cancer diagnosis, um, did chemo and radiation for that, came out of that at the same body weight. Has, That's crazy. She yeah. came out of it at the same body weight. Yeah, also had significant tissue removed, came out of it with the same body weight, and uh, I think she's squatted 100 for a triple, and she's a 73-year-old lady. Um, That's awesome. We've had Philip, Philip Midkiff on the... We just had him on the YouTube channel, he, same thing, and he had cancer was in a slightly different spot. It was in his temple area. The radiation was awfully close, and a lot of like the impact that it has on the area of your face around the cancer was similar to what you went through, Paul. Yeah, that's that's the thing is, uh, you know, you, you don't, and and they kept telling me, like, when I got the nausea, they're like, well, that's not supposed to happen. I'm like, well, it is happening. Right. You know, and, and, you know, into week three, when I was experiencing the pain, they're like, well, you shouldn't be experiencing that much pain yet. And I was like, well, he, this is the reality of it. Apparently my body is, isn't enjoying this, but when it, you know, when it comes to the, the barbell training and, and, you know, you almost sound like, like you're some kind of a, uh, a cultist or whatever, but the, the fact of the matter is if you're going to live, be alive, or if you're going to be alive, live, you know, if you're going to be alive, live. And, when you, wh whether it's cancer or whether it's some other kind of diagnosis or what have you, but one of the hardest things about it, I believe, and I'm, I'm sure other people would say the same thing, is is the mental weight on you. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I had a lot of days in the first couple of weeks where you know you you don't want to have quiet time because when you have quiet time, that reality just sits on you. The uncertainty is the question mark just sits on yeah. you, and. You're doing it for yourself. You're not doing it for anybody else. I'm not, you know, it is to actually train, is to is to deliberately fight against it. And it's not to surrender to it. You know, I, I like I said, I'm not an expert on this by any stretch of the imagination, but I know what my experience was. And if I can offer that experience to others, and you know, we've have a pretty vast audience with student of the gun. And since my diagnosis and since, you know, post-treatment and everything, we've got lots of emails and messages and so forth. You know, my dad is going through this, my you know, mom or my uncle or my whatever, you know, what is your suggestion? And I'm like, my suggestion is essentially everything that's in that book. And, and, you know, when it comes to fighting, the, the main thing that I want to drive home to the audience and everyone else is, you know, fight is an arbitrary word. People say, you know, we get cancer and everyone loves to say, oh, we're going to fight this and, and let's, you know, I need you to be strong. I need you to fight. Let's, we're going to fight. Everyone says it. You know, everyone says, let's, we're going to fight this. We're going to fight this together. You know, you all hold hands and you, you say, we're going to fight. No one ever tells you how. No one ever says how to fight. Mm -hmm. Everyone throws the word fight around. All right, we're going to fight this. How? We're going to fight this by surrendering to the whims of the medical community. I understand doctors are important. I understand nurses are important. I had some good doctors and good nurses. But the fact of the matter is, is it's you. It's your body. At the end of the day, they're going to go home. In fact, you know, they're going to take off the 4th of July while you... Uh, they're going to take off the 4th of July. They're going to take off, you know, what Memorial Day or whatever. They're going home. It, you, If you want to fight, it, it has to be you. And control what you can control. And that's what I did. I, I examined the situation and I was like, okay, I'm going to control anything that is within my power to control, I'm going to. And that was, you know, with the ketogenic diet, that was with the training and that, you know, and so forth. I controlled that. I controlled my environment. Did you guys enjoy the, uh, my little story about the hospital gowns? I did. And, and how I was not going to wear one. Yes. Because that's what dead people wear. 
because when you sit around in a hospital gown, you look like a cancer victim. You surrender. Right. Yeah, you you look you do. You look like a sick person. And somebody probably died in that thing last week anyway, and they send to the laundry. I don't want to wear that crap. And so I didn't. You wear a suit. I mean, obviously I had to expose my upper chest and everything. I got three tattoos across my, you know, my chest here so they can line me up in the gamma machine. But you know, I, I'm very fortunate. I have a wonderful mother who was a seamstress and she made me scrub tops out of manly material. I had a U.S. Marine Corps, you know, scrub top. And, and when I went in there and I was the only one and that here's the sick and strange thing is I was the only one in that cancer ward that didn't sit around looking like a cancer victim. You know, I know I'm doing the knife hand and everything for everybody who can't see on the radio, but if the fact of the matter is, I could control that. If I get cancer, I'm going to borrow your fatigue scrubs, and I'm going to wear and I'm going to wear a helmet. <laughs> uh, you, you, they're going to have a hard time putting your head in the, in the cage with a helmet on, but maybe you get it somewhere that's else not the cancer you're, you're, get. in your butthole or whatever. Right, that's what I'm going to get. And, and when you, yeah, and that's another thing. When you're me, when you're when you're this age and you say cancer, everyone like goes to your nether regions. Right. Like, is it in your butthole or is it in your or balls your or you know? Like, no, <laughs> neither. <laughs> your front buns or your back buns. Yeah, and I was like, neither. I'm like, oh, that's weird. Uh, control what you can control. Fight. You're either going to die of a heart attack, you're going to hit a tree while you're skiing or driving, or you're going to get cancer, you're going to get Alzheimer's. You know, very few of us get to just die peacefully in our sleep because of old age. So uh, put that muscle mass in the bank because you're going to need it. So yep. uh, go ahead and get started now. Meanwhile... Go to studentofthegun.com and you can sign up there. You go to that homepage, there's so much stuff for you to do and have. You can sign up there and get seven training tips that could save your life. You can get a free ebook. Go to <laughs> Amazon. You can go get Fighting Solves Everything, Professor Paul's book about his, uh, his crusade against his cancer last year. And of course, Nicholas Orr's book. Reynolds, Shoot and I were talking today. We did a little math. Yes. We've been doing this online coaching thing for about how long? About four years. Yeah, you and me, four years. Yeah. Everybody else a little Last time I checked, there's about 52 weeks in a year. Yeah, you can talk about how many videos we've seen broken down. Yeah, I think the organization has watched about two and a half million sets. Of lifts? Yep. I think, I did the math the other day, I think we've done just over a million squats alone. Yeah, I believe that's probably right. That's over probably a true. million squats alone at Barbell Logic. 2.5 million sets. Sets, right. Yep. Paul, you've only had in-person coaching how many times? Just once or a couple times? A couple times. I, I had the, when we did the first one with you, right with me, and then uh, the summer of 2018, we did our little North American tour, and oh, we right. we, yeah, we right. popped down and there you and came to my house. Yep, and right. uh, you let me christen your freaking your your yep. jagged uh, deadlift bar. Has Graham ever coached you in person? No. So you've really only been coached in person a couple times. All the rest of it's just been online. Yeah. Uh, so guys. Listen, armor yourself against this cancer in the hard times to come, because hard times are coming. And uh, go ahead and start weight training now. And I thought, tell you what, there's not another organization in the world that has watched more sets and reps and helped more people get strong than Barbologic Online Coaching. So go do that. If you don't, you just probably have a death wish. Yeah. You know, I was thinking when Paul was saying that his, his doctor and doctors, it, they're sort of like up in the air about if you should strength train while you're going through chemotherapy and or radiation. You know, they're like, ah, we think maybe you should be doing strength training. But my guess is that every single one of them would say, yeah, you should, before you get cancer, probably a real good idea. Yeah, doctors are always wanting you to get healthy. Remember what I told you the other day? Just like one week ago, I went in for my three month, they scoped me in and they do the whole, how are you feeling? You know, what are you, how's your pain level? And yada, yada. And how's your energy level? You know, how's your energy? And I said, well, my energy level is to the point where I'm, I'm back to training. I'm barbell training. I'm lifting three times a week. And she says, and, and, and any other exercises? What else are you doing? And I said, I don't think you understand what lifting means. I said, I'm lifting a barbell. And, and my friend of mine said, he goes, and Jeff Kirkham said, he goes, you should have told her you're taking a brisk walk three times a, a week. And she'd been okay. like, oh, that's good. Yeah, she'd really that. good. Good for you. That. Good for you. Good for you. Well, guys, thank you for listening. There's another Barbologic podcast. There's another guy that has licked cancer uh, because of his, the hardiness he learned in the gym, the muscle mass he put on that frame um, before the, the illness struck him. 
and the discipline that he's gotten through all of his training, by the way, all of the training has contributed probably to your success with this, I bet, Professor. So uh, if you have any questions about what we do or the show or anything that we can help you with, email us at questions at barbell-logic.com. You can also, if you, if you want to, if you want to, if you want to that's, some, that's Oklahoma for if you would like, you can email experience at barbell-logic.com and uh, we'll, we'll let you take a little test drive of the coaching service and uh, see if we can get you on your way to being a stronger you. So thank you guys so much for listening and we'll talk to you in, I don't know, three or four days. And so now I'm really excited to give an update on Professor Paul because here he is a year cancer-free and he is hitting PRs at Barbell Logic and training and so just wanted to welcome Professor Paul to the show and and have some updates there. You're here, by the way. Welcome <laughs> I'm to the still show. Here. <laughs> it was tough, man. It had beat you up, but I thought it was really important to bring you back on the show and give an update. How long have you been cancer free? Uh, well, I got my crazy thing is the anniversary is coming up. My all clean scan, you know, the PET scan where they scan you from you know your scalp to your toes and yeah. check cancer. Uh, my all clean scan was September 11th. Okay. There you go. It's an easy day yeah. to remember. So, uh, yeah, in two days, it'll be one year. And I didn't even, wasn't even thinking about that until you asked me. It's so wild. And so what's awesome about your story is, uh, you're doing pretty good. Yeah. I, I, I had to lay off when I was, I was hospitalized, uh, kind of flat on my back and, uh, I, I could not train, but I trained all the way up until the point that I was hospitalized. And, uh, then I, when I was released from the hospital, I was pretty weak and I had a feeding tube in and it was all horrible nonsense. But, uh, after a couple of months, I got back into the gym and I started essentially like an infant with empty bars. I just started back trying to re teach my body the forms and so forth. So it's been amazing to watch. So you, first off you trained, you were as strong as you had ever been in your life when you were diagnosed with cancer, right? That, correct. Absolutely. And then you continued to train for quite some time until you got so sick that you had to be hospitalized, couldn't train. But remember that we've talked about this on the podcast many times before is that strength is the thing that lasts the longest. And so you and I have talked about this off the air like the role that the strength training played, like you were making deposits into that strength and physical 401k. And then for several months, you were making heavy withdrawals. The, the cancer was making heavy withdrawals, but because you had built up that balance so much, you know, it might've saved your life. You lived, you, you made oh, it through. It, I think it actually, it hundred percent did. Uh, there was a guy who had the same cancer as me. Uh, when I was, I was in the hospital, I was not in intensive care. I mean, I was under close care. You know how that is. But there was a guy who had the same cancer as me, and he was on life support in intensive care after having going, gone through the same therapy yep. uh, as I was. And so you, you, know, you got to a, some point there where you, you were hospitalized and sick enough that you couldn't train. You trained all the way up to that point. And then I can remember you texting me the video of you squatting on that first day back with the, with the empty bar. Mm -hmm. you, you were a shell of your former self. You were you know, this little skinny guy, had no hair. And you started squatting and you just LP'd and your coach Graham and you, you've been with us for a long time at Barbell Logic. We just added a tiny little bit every single workout. And now here you are a year later, cancer free. And where are you at now on your strength levels? Dude, I just hit uh, last week or two weeks ago or whatever it was. I just hit a press PR, an all time lifetime press PR. Lifetime press PR. Yeah. Post cancer. How heavy was it? It was 170. 170 and you are you are not 32. No, I'm 53. 53 years old. What what are your other lifts looking like right now? Your post cancer. All of my all of my lifts are I'm getting back to I haven't tried any PRs with any of the other lifts. Uh but most of my my workouts now I'm in in kind of middle intermediate. Graham's moved me inter intermediate and I'm actually doing a 4 day split now. But most of my my stuff is getting close to where my workouts were before cancer. Sure. Like for instance, I was, you know, my, my average squat workouts were in the high twos, low threes. Yep. Uh, and now, you know, I'm, I'm working like today, I'm going to do, uh, 280 yep. on the squat, you know? And how about your deadlift? For me, I think I was doing pretty well. My, my deadlifts, you know, my heavy deadlift workout sessions were in the high threes. Now I'm only actually doing it around three now, uh, but we're also doing 
uh, like three by threes, yeah, and, more volume and, and a lot of volume and supplementing with rows and things like that. So awesome. Uh, it, 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 what's funny is the upper came back faster than the lower. Yeah, that is interesting. Well, and some of it, yeah, it's just it, those weights are a little lighter, so you'll get to them a little quicker as well. And it takes some time to put some body weight back on, right? So yeah. you look good, though. You look healthy at this point. You look athletic. Uh, you don't look like a guy who had cancer a year ago. Yeah, I dropped 50 pounds in two months. Mm. So that's a lot. <laughs> and how much have you put back on? Uh, I put back on 30. Yeah. So I'm around 228 now. And that's probably about a good spot for you to be. Yeah. I love your story because it shows the power of strength training, not just to get you through the sickness, but that like you've come through it on, on the other side now, and you are really basically as strong as you were before cancer. Only now you're probably a mm, hundred times more mentally tough than you were than yeah. you were then, you know? Yeah. And that, that really, you know, it, that's it. It's not just physical, it's mental. There, you can't separate the two. Awesome. And, when, when you know that you can do something, you know that you can do it. I love it. So thank you for the update, sir. You guys can do this. We've talked about it before. Most of us will not get handed this deck of cards, this hand, but we will get handed something. You know, you break up with your wife or girlfriend or significant other. You have tragedy in your family. You're hit with COVID or losses of jobs or whatever that is. And this pain into that strength 401k, it is surprising how well it carries over to the other things in life far beyond just the physical. And I think Professor Paul's story is certainly one that shows that as well as, as John Wilson. So thanks for sharing the story. And if you want to read more about Professor Paul's fight with cancer, he's got a great book on Amazon. You can go to Amazon and by fighting solves everything, destroying cancer with faith, nutrition, and science by Paul Markle. That's M-A-R-K-E-L. Check it out. It's a great book. He also talks great and says nice things about Barbell Logic and about us working with him over the last couple of years. And so we're thankful for the uh, shout out that he gave us in the book. And so check that book out and read more about his story of his battle with cancer and how he's come through on the other side. Again, fighting solves everything, destroying cancer with faith, nutrition, and science.